officially start the uh, introduction, and so this is when we'll start recording. I want to introduce Courtney Weber. Uh, Dr. Weber is the small fruit breeder that we at Cornell University are very fortunate to have. He is working primarily with strawberries and raspberries, and I don't know if you're doing any work with blackberries, Courtney, but um, he'll kind of discuss what he's talking about, but he's and talk to us about caneberry varieties. Great, thanks, Laura. Uh, good morning, everybody. Glad to see everybody up and out. We're gonna be about 50 degrees here in Geneva today. Uh, I don't know what it's like in the Eastern part, but I suspect similar. So I'm gonna share my screen here so we can get started. Okay, and we'll go to full screen. So I'm gonna to talk to you today, uh, primarily about raspberries. Laura did mention uh, I work with strawberries uh, and raspberries primarily. Uh, I do a little bit of work with blackberries, trying to develop some primary cane blackberries that are suitable for New York. Um, in raspberry, we work in red raspberry and black raspberry and some of the hybrids. So we have some purple material as well, as you can see in that, in that tray there, we have all different colors that show up. And uh, so, thumbnails out of the way. And so the title of my, of my presentation today is uh, choosing raspberry or bramble varieties for your situation. And of course that raises the question, just what is your situation? Um, it, it's an important question. So when we, when we um, talk about planting a new, a new planting, we always talk about site selection being so important, right? You have to have a good site to have a good planting. Um, well, knowing what you wanna do with what you're planting is equally important. Um, so you have to know your market because no variety is going to fulfill the, the needs of every situation. Um, and so knowing what kind of market you have, is it fresh versus processing, local versus wholesale? Um, are you gonna pre-pick it or are you gonna have to pick your own? Um, do you want to do it in the summer or in the fall? So for, with brambles, you have all of those options and often it's a mix of all of them. So of course, no, no one situation is the same. And then what are your production conditions? Do you have high tunnels or is this going to be in the open field? Can you make raised beds um, or is it going to be on a flat bed? How is your soil? Do you have drainage issues or do you have a light soil? And these make big differences on which varieties you might want to choose and which ones are going to perform well for you. And so a combination of all those things will drive your variety selection choices and give you options when choosing. And so one of the first things that is, is important of knowing when you wanna have raspberries. Um, and we'll talk raspberries primarily because blackberries are pretty difficult for most of, of New York. But if you have specific questions about blackberries, we can talk about that too. Um, but we can have raspberries in, in most of the, the central and Southern part of New York from sometime in late June to uh, late November sometimes, with, if you have high tunnels. If you don't have high tunnels, of course, frost cuts that off usually sometime in October for most of us. Um, and so, you know, if you're having fruit coming in in June, maybe school's not out yet and people aren't coming to your farm market yet. And so maybe that's too early. Um, or maybe you wanna get people started right away coming to your farm and you got strawberries coming and you wanna have strawberries and raspberries at the same time. And so looking at the timing, and maybe you don't want to have fruit into October, November, because your market has dried up and people aren't coming and they're not looking for local raspberries anymore. And so it varies quite a bit. Uh, and there are a lot of varieties that to address uh, various times of the year as far as when you want to have fruit. Um, some people just want to do floricanes. That'd be the summer types, and they don't want to mess with the fall types because of SWD, for instance. Um, and sometimes it's the opposite. They don't wanna mess with pruning for the summer types. So they just do the fall types so that they can mow them off in the, after harvest or in the spring and not have to worry about hand pruning on your knees uh, in the wet field in the spring. So there are different reasons at different times of year why you might want different varieties. Um, so we talk about high tunnels. I would encourage high tunnel production. Uh, the advantages in my opinion, far outweigh the challenges that people find. 
uh, the fruit quality and the increased yield and size of the fruit is really outstanding. Uh, keeping rain off of the berries for, for brambles especially is so, so important. They're soft to start with. When they get rained on, you really reduce your shelf life from uh, down to maybe a couple of days. Um, if they kept dry in a high tunnel, for instance, and picked it when it's cool in the day, sometimes you can have seven or 10 days worth of shelf life. Now, we don't want people storing uh, raspberry seven days uh, in our market, but it does give, give the consumer a, a better window for consuming anything they buy. Um, raspberries generally cost a lot and consumers want fruit that's fresh. Um, so keeping them under high tunnels reduces fruit rots. We have much, much less incidence of gray mold, uh, botrytis, uh, that fruit size is larger, firmer, and then you can expand your season. So in the spring, if you're doing it on summer varieties, you can bring your varieties on 10 days earlier. So you might be having uh, fruit on prelude in the early part of June. And in the fall, you can extend it well past when the fall rains start. So into October, November, um, you can have fruit the quality is good. Raspberries like cool weather, so they'll continue to ripen, uh, and you can do a lot extending that season on both ends. Um, and then with spotted wing Drosophila, there has been work with netting, uh, often in blueberries, but there are people doing it in raspberries as well, covering high tunnels with insect control netting to keep the spotted wing Drosophila out. Uh, raspberries are very, very uh, attractive to that insect, and that is a real problem. So there are possibilities with high tunnels and netting to keep those out. And it'll keep other insects out as well. Um, larger insects such as uh, Japanese beetle, uh, sap beetle and other, other pests for raspberry. There are some challenges. Some varieties don't do well in high tunnels because of excess vigor. Varieties like Caroline and Killarney do not respond well to that environment. They grow over, uh, over vigorously and will uh, make it harder to manage them. Uh, varieties like Canby and Nantahala can have problems with powdery mildew. So you want to avoid varieties that would get powdery mildew. Uh, we sometimes see uh, leaf and fruit rust late in the season. Um, it's not real common. And there are higher management requirements. Of course, you have to have drip irrigation and drip fertilizer. So you really have to manage the water and, and nutrition well. We can see uh, uh, increased spider mite pressure. So we do recommend uh, using um, beneficial mites to keep those under control. And that is something you need to do before you have an outbreak, uh, continuously to keep the predatory mite populations high. And if you do have to spray, it can be challenging, um, especially if the tunnels are, are larger units that are long, um, it's hard to get in there with any kind of equipment. Um, it can be done. Um, shorter units can be done with a backpack or even from the ends with a, an air blast type sprayer where you uh, fog kind of into the tunnel. And we've had good luck with that in tunnels up to 100 feet long or so. Um, and there are some other morphological problems or physiological problems that sometimes pop up, like sunburn um, or double fruit that can be a challenge to deal with in certain varieties. So a little bit about some of the, well, here's high tunnel. So you can see we get very good vigor and uh, you can see in the row middles there, hygiene is a big big concern in high tunnels to make sure that the, the aisles stay clean of plant debris and uh, uh, culled fruit to make sure that you don't have a spot for some of these insect pests to, to cause problems. Um, you can see very healthy plants. The fruit is displayed well, so it's easy to pick. And of course it stays dry. Uh, so harvest can be done any day of the week, whether it's raining or not. So in the fall, that can really be a great advantage. We see some of the physiological problems sometimes we have. Double fruit sometimes is caused in the heat of the summer when they're flowering, and you can see it on some of the earlier primocane varieties. Uh, that tends to go away as the temperatures cool down and the flowers are ripening or opening in a cooler and developing in a cooler situation. Uh, sunburn we see sometimes midsummer in some of the varieties. We don't see it a lot, but occasionally we see it. Uh, most of the varieties that we grow are pretty, pretty tolerant. Um, we don't see a lot of it, but uh, the fruit is just not marketable. It's edible, but not marketable because people just, they think there's something wrong with it, of course. And then down on the lower left, you see powdery mildew. So that's a picture of Canby. When, you, when uh, the humidity gets high um, in midsummer, sometimes you can get powdery mildew problems. And of course, 
people don't want fuzzy fruit. Um, so that's a problem. So it's varieties that should be avoided that can have powdery mildew like canby and not the hala. And some of the black raspberries, especially in the fall um, for Niwot. So uh, in a scenario here, um, there are different uh, situations that you might uh, find yourself in. Um, open field, pick your own and pre-picked summer season um, on farm sales. So you want vigorous varieties for those open field situations because the, the situation is not as, as conducive to growing as is under a high tunnel. Um, you want un, upright growth habits so you don't have to trellis as, as extensively. And maybe the size and color aren't as important because consumers are out in the field or they're buying it from your market and they're tasting the fruit. Um, and so they're not, um, they're not buying just with their eyes. So a variety like Prelude's very early, comes in on June, um, very disease resistant. It's uh, really a good all around berry, except for it tends to be a little small. Nova, then in the mid season, you might wanna try a, a blush variety like double gold. Now double gold has a primocaine crop as well. Um, and you can go to Encore. And there's a new variety eaten out. I don't know much about it. Um, out of Nova Scotia might be something worth trying. And then if you, you're interested in black raspberries, there's really three varieties that uh, people use for the early, mid and late season, but that still only gets you about 20 days worth of harvest. So here's Prelude. You can see the fruit displayed at the top of the plant. That really helps for pest management because it keeps the plant dry, keeps the fruit dry uh, because it can, uh, winds can come through after the dew and dry that off quickly. It makes sprays penetrate very well. Uh, it is a fairly small plant, uh, small fruit, but it is ripening when no other variety is ripening. So it, it is uh, quite an advantage for that reason alone. It does double crop. It produces about 20 to 30% of its uh, crop in the fall, and then the remainder of the crop in the summer. Um, as compared to most of the fall bearing types do 50 to 60% of their crop in the fall. And so that gives you an idea of the crop load you're gonna see. It's vigorous, resistant to, uh, to Phytophthora as well. So it is a very good all around plant. Um, here's Nova, also considered very disease resistant, uh, cold hardy, high vigor, uh, good quality fruit, tends to be dark. Uh, so if you pick your own, it's fine. And if you go on process, it's nice because of that color. If you're going to containerize it and put it in your market, it might look a little dark on the shelf. And so there's where you want to decide what kind of market you want to put this in. Here's double gold. It's really the only blush peach colored variety on the marketplace. When you freeze it, it does freeze pink. It's very attractive in a frozen state. It tends to be fairly soft, so it does have great shelf life. The flavor is outstanding, so people pick it and try it. Um, they're usually very impressed. It's a very tall plant. Also has a bit of a fall crop. It's fairly late. Again, um, it's probably a little more of a fall crop than, than Prelude, but it's a tall plant, so you can get a good summer crop on that as well. And it's relatively early. And it's tolerant to fight top the root rot as well. So it has very good vigor. So you get into the blacks, they all look fairly similar. That color is very typical. Um, Bristol tends to be on the small side, but it's glossy black and a little bit earlier than the other varieties. That's very classic black raspberry flavor. Um, black raspberries all tend to be susceptible to powdery mildew and verticillium wilt. So you want well-drained soil for the verticillium wilt. The powdery mildew usually does not set in until after harvest and you see it in the summer on the, uh, on the new growth. And so it's not a huge problem. It can be an issue if you have them in high tunnels in the late part of their season. Um, it is most black raspberries as well are resistant to Phytophthora. So if you have uh, drainage issues, but not verticillium, um, Phytophthora doesn't really bother this plant. But verticillium is, gets on a lot of different crops. So you don't wanna follow black raspberries to after tomatoes or other solanaceous crops, for instance. So here's Jewel, just a little bit later, generally larger than Bristol. Generally, the yields in black raspberries are less than red raspberry, somewhere between a half and two thirds of what a red raspberry in the same season will yield. Um, so you would expect to charge a little bit more for that fruit. Again, susceptible to powdery mildew and verticillium, but resistant to Phytophthora. In the high tunnels, we see uh, larger fruit on most varieties. In black raspberry, that tends to make the fruit a little tighter in the clusters because the clusters don't get uh, 
the pedicels don't get longer, so the fruit gets a little closer together. And that can cause some issues in harvest. And in, in jewel, particularly, the fruit gets larger, tends to be a little lumpy, um, but still very good eating quality. And tunnels do increase the yield in black grass very considerably. And then Mac black, as you can see at the same time as the other varieties are ripening, and in harvest, black ras uh, Mac black is still green to pink. And so you get an extra seven to 10 days after Jewel to expand the uh, black raspberry season a little bit. Uh, it's a vigorous plant, medium, large berries, resistant to Phytophthora. Again, um, it is susceptible to crown gall as well. We don't see crown gall a lot in New York, but every so often it pops up and you'll see galls on the, uh, on the root system or at the base of the canes um, or the base of the crown in black raspberry. Um, and if you have crown gall in your soil, you will always have crown gall, crown gall in your soil. It doesn't go away. And so that's something that you might find out after the fact, because it's not really something you can test for. So in the late season, then Encore. So Encore is a pretty nice berry. It is um, resistant to aphids, which lowers the mosaic virus incidence. Um, but it, and it's powdery mildew resistant, so it works well in the high tunnels but it is very susceptible to Phytophthora root rot. So if you're gonna grow Encore, you either need it in tunnels where you get good drainage um, in well-drained soil, but we really recommend raised beds for this to help that drainage. And if you do that, it can perform very well. It has very large fruit late into the season. Um, sometimes the fruit will ripen through the end of July and start to overlap even with some of the early primocane varieties to, to close that summer window. Um, we occasionally see spring uh, frost, not frost damage, cold damage, where we have a warm spell in say February or March where it gets in the 50s or so, uh, maybe 60s and the plant starts to come out of dormancy and then you get a cold snap. Um, we sometimes see a little bit of cold damage from that. So scenario two, um, on-farm sales, local wholesale, pre-picked, not having anybody come on your farm to pick. You've got high tunnels and you just want to do the fall season. So you might be supplying uh, other farmers markets, uh, your local supermarket, uh, you might have your own farm stand. And so you, and with the high tunnels, then you can expand some of these varieties that maybe don't work as well in the open field. Uh, you might go with polka in the early season, very nice eating quality berry. Uh, Joan Jay is very high yielding variety, it's thornless. Uh, people like it to work with it. Um, you can get into Himbo Top in the late season. Himbo Top has potential for a double crop as well. It tends to be a very tall plant with fruit at the top. And then, uh, or a variety like Crimson Treasure, my newest variety that uh, starts in the mid season and continues through the late season. Very, very long season uh, crop. And then there's some new varieties from Europe. Uh, Kwanzaa probably has the best fruit quality, but it tends to be on the late side. So it would need high tunnels in order for you to have a good quality fruit. So there's polka, tends to be dark, but very, very good tasting. It is powdery mildew resistant. We do see po potato leaf hopper problems with it. Um, so we, we recommend keeping the, the tunnel, uh, the outside the tunnel mowed well to keep those hopper populations low. Uh, here's Joan Jay, also dark, but a very good dual use berry, uh, makes a nice color jam because of, of the dark color and people like eating it. It has a very good flavor and it's firm. So it has a good shelf life. Um, generally too short for double cropping. And again, most of these that I'm mentioning, they are powdery mildew resistant uh, for that high tunnel use. Uh, here's Himbo Top, a little brighter red, uh, requires extra trellising because it tends to be a tall plant. Uh, so you could possibly double crop it. Tends to be a bit on the soft side because the, uh, the, the, the hole in it is, uh, tends to be a little bit large, the cavity. So it needs to be handled uh, carefully in order for it to not collapse in the, in, the, in the container. Here's Crimson Treasure, it's my newest variety. Uh, very highly branched, and that's why it uh, fruits for so long. So it generally starts fruiting sometime in late August and will continue to the end of the season uh, into October and November. It is powdery mildew resistant and Phytophthora resistant. And so it's not a super high, uh, tall plant because of all the branching, but it does produce a lot of fruiting laterals and a lot of fruit. And we see a, an equal, yield uh, in the summer as well as the fall. So it can be double crop, even though it tends to be a bit short. Uh, here you can see how it displays its fruit. Um, and you can see ripe fruit in the middle, 
And on the top there, you can see flowers still developing. So you can see those flowers won't be ripe for another 30, or 30 days or more. Uh, so you can see it can uh, have fruit for a very long time. Uh, the third scenario, you might want to see fresh and processing, fall season, open field. And so then you want high vigor varieties again, early to mid season to get them out of the field before the weather turns and root rot tolerance. So variety might, Caroline might work well on the open field where it's too vigorous for inside the tunnels. Or Joan Jay again, high yielding, darker fruit, dual use type of variety. And then Heritage, uh, it's an older variety that people know, it processes well, makes good jam, and is very resistant to a lot of the diseases. Um, so you don't see too much trouble. Occasionally it'll get rust on the fruit. Um, not a big problem for processing because it doesn't change the processing quality. And so there's other varieties out there, of course, if you want a yellow one, Anne is probably the best variety out there. For me, BP1 tends to be a bit darker than I like, and it is uh, susceptible to powder, uh, Phytophthora in our trials. Niwa is a black raspberry that is marketed as a primocane fruiting, and it does primocane fruit, but probably only about 10% of the crop. Um, so it's really just a novelty for that fall crop. It is very powdery mildew resistant or susceptible in the fall. So if you have it in the that fall crop in high tunnels, it will be covered in powdery mildew. Um, for a specialty variety, crimson night might be something in a high tunnel that you would be interested in. Super dark fruit, uh, almost looks like a purple, and it tends to be late. Um, in the floricane, Killarney is still a standard, but generally only for the outside. In tunnels, it tends to be, um, the, 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 the canes are really weepy and hard to manage. They overgrow, so it's not something you want to do. Uh, tulamine is really, what people have done when they do greenhouse production, great flavored, um, but really susceptible to cold and phytophthora, so not great for our area. And if you want a purple for processing, royalty is probably the variety that most people would choose. So there's Crimson Night, just to give you an idea of what dark looks like. Um, that fruit can be very attractive, it freezes very well, processes well, but it's very unusual because of the dark. With that, uh, here's there's a lot of information on the web. Cornell uh, has the fruit Cornell website, uh, fruit.cornell.edu, where there's a berry page with a lot of information on tunnels, on the raspberry production guide is there, pest management guidelines, all that type of thing. Penn State manages a site as well. Um, and there's other information online about high tunnels. Um, you can reach me directly. Um, I'm happy to, to, to talk to people. Uh, or you can check out our Facebook page. You can leave notes there. And if you're a nursery or interested in, in uh, propagating, uh, the varieties that Cornell develops are freely available for licensing. Um, of course, there's a royalty that has to be collected on sales, but there's no charge to actually have a license to propagate. Uh, and in Canada, the Ontario berry growers are uh, our partners. Um, do just to throw up a couple of pictures of stuff we're working on. There's 1614, that is in grower trials across New York. You can see we're looking for that big bright red fruit that displays well. And that's something that hopefully one of these selections will turn into a variety in the near future. Uh, here's another one, 1736. You see, we really like that open canopy that really helps with pest management with uh, phytops or, or with gray mold to keep the fruit dry and allow penetration of pests, of pesticide sprays if they're needed. Um, and so that, and it also makes it easier to harvest because you can uh, access the fruit, it's not hidden and, and fruit is not lost or missed. And so you, you reduce the amount of spotted wing drosophila just because you don't have um, overripe fruit in there that can be infected. And with that, my time, is up. I will hang around, I guess, for some questions at uh, other times or later, or, and uh, I appreciate your attention. Thanks, Courtney. Um, Sorry about that. No, that's fine. I, and I did put in the chat box the Cornell Berry Nursery um, website. So there's a a uh, really nice tool that helps people source a lot of these varieties, all of these varieties really with a wide, wide choice of nurseries that probably some of you haven't heard of all of them and they link right to the nursery's website. So it makes it a little easier for folks to try out different sources and compare prices and availability and things. So I encourage people to look, uh, look at that. 
Um, looks like there is a question from Karsten. Are you exploring any varieties specifically for mechanical harvesting methods? So we are not, uh, we are not particularly interested in mechanical harvesting in our region. Um, generally, the mechanical harvesters are producing for frozen fruit and they, they beat up the fruit. And uh, so there's very specific varieties that uh, release the fruit very easily. Um, Pacific Northwest is a much better climate for that type of production and the yields they get are far outweigh what we could do here. So that's something we're not really working with. Um, we are working on a project, uh, exploring a project for fresh market uh, machine harvest, um, but that's in the very beginning stages. So we got some engineers involved who want to look at building a maybe a artificial hand to pick fruit, but that's what it would take. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable how quickly we're moving forward in that. Well, everybody has labor problems, right? And and berries are picked by hand. And if you can't get someone to pick them, you're just spinning your wheels. Yeah. Um, are there any other questions? All right, Courtney, if you are able to stick around for a little bit, things sometimes do pop up. Yeah, I'll be here for the rest of the program this morning. Okay, great. Right. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, that was very good. All right, I'm gonna share my screen and we'll get into the next um, presentation. All right, is that uh, full screen for everyone? Yes, it is. All right, great. So we're gonna move into blackberries now. Um, blackberries are a really tricky crop for most of us in this state to grow. We get just uh, really cold temperatures in the winter and that is very challenging to manage. A lot of cane die back and it can be very frustrating. So variety selection is important and we're not gonna talk about that right here, but uh, there's also some ways that you can culturally manage these plants to help get them through the winter, but also just manage them for whatever crop that you do have to try to have a better crop. Um, trellising provides that structure for the training. So most people that are growing blackberries because they're such a large, vigorous plant have some type of trellis. Um, the trellis allows for an open canopy, hopefully so that you can get more sun to the plant and therefore get better vigor and hopefully better fruit quality. Um, but some of these trellis systems can also provide um, the option to shade that fruit during key ripening times and maybe help prevent some of those heat and sun related disorders that happen on fruit droplets uh, like sun scald, uh, white droop, and just some of the other problems that sun beating on the fruit can really be, a, be an issue. Um, canopy or trellises help kind of disperse that plant canopy so that you can get better air movement, better pesticide efficiency uh, penetration. And then obviously, if you have some of the trellises that we're going to talk about mostly, it, it could actually help with your winter hardiness. So the rotating and the shift trellises allow for you to move the canes down where they're going to be more protected during the winter. And we'll talk about that. But truly, one of the biggest things is that we can increase yields and increased harvest efficiency. And whether you have a pick your own, increasing harvest efficiency and yields is, or, or you're doing it yourself, both of those are really key to, to making money with um, blackberries. Uh, a really great um, guide is the North Carolina State University guide. And I have in the notes section, um, oops, we've got a polling, that poll. Did you see that poll, Natasha? Um, hang on, let me, oh, people are answering. Oh, it. That's okay, that's good. Go ahead and answer it. <laughs> okay. That'll get that first one out of the way. And if you want DEC credits, please, you need to uh, make sure you answer this poll. If you don't want DEC credits, you can still answer it. And we wanna make sure that we 
leave enough time for everybody to answer it. And there's absolutely no right or wrong answer. This is really kind of gives us a little bit of information about the group and it also is something that we can provide to the DEC to make sure that they know everybody is still in attendance. All right, I think that's good. Do I click the end polling? Um, it doesn't matter, I can do that. Okay. I'm gonna give you 10 more seconds to answer this. If you haven't already. All right, we're gonna end the polling. Great, and I'm gonna just share the res, oops. Can't share the poll, that's all right, we don't need to. Okay, so um, the North Carolina State University guide and the information, the link to that is in the notes section of this PowerPoint, which will be posted on the Teachable. And that gives a lot of uh, description um, about how to construct these pictures and also some cost estimates, et cetera. But there's a lot of different trellises and a lot of people around here are using um, mostly T trellises, uh, just different um, kind of variations of materials and things. But this, uh, the picture is of a shift trellis and that's kind of what we're trying to, we're, we're looking forward to trying to create blackberries that look like this. They have a very uh, kind of a narrow canopy, a narrow row, but they're extremely productive. And so that's what we're shooting for. And I'm not gonna spend too much time on this, but I want people to realize that the terminology and understanding how a blackberry plant works is really important. Um, most of you know that they're biennial. It takes a two year life cycle for the fruit to develop on the canes. Um, and that the prima cane is a one year old cane. That's that first year old cane that grows from the crown. There are primocane blackberry varieties that will put fruit out that first year, just like a primocane raspberry. But in our area, we don't have a long enough growing season. Even in tunnels, it's hard to get high quality fruit from the primocane varieties. So there is a possibility that some of you have been successful in that, but by and large, the research that's been done on those varieties have not shown that they work that well in New York or the Northeast. So we're mostly growing, we're attempting to grow floricane varieties. And the lateral branch in this picture, this lateral is developing, it comes off of the um, uh, main primocane during that first year. And then the floricane, the, this primocane turns into what we call a floricane. And then that is where those flower shoots develop, is off of the lateral branches on that floricane. Oops, and you can have basal flower shoots, which are really, uh, they can be a real problem for raspberry growers um, because if you don't prune your canes short enough, you can have a, a lot of early crop from raspberries. I don't think that's usually a problem with the blackberries that I've worked with here in New York. We just don't have um, that many, but that is a problem, especially that's where the snow cover is. So if you're not pruning those canes down, you could have those kind of early fruit and they fruit at the wrong time and they gather sp spotted wing and they're just difficult to manage. So you do want to make sure you don't have uh, those basal flower shoots. But all trellis systems help. This is a picture I just kind of grabbed off the internet, but I thought it was really funny because this is what a lot of times it looks like. It's a little scary sometimes going into those canopies. And this is another one. I believe this is from um, one of Marvin Pritz's early uh, uh, research trials with uh, blackberries and tunnels. And if you can see the, the growth is just enormous. It grows all the way to the top of the tunnel. Just a really big deal. And so trellis systems can help us tame these beasts. So I just wanna quickly talk about the rotating cross arm trellis. Um, this is from trellis system uh, manufacturing and I've got trellis growing systems. These, uh, this comp, they're fairly complicated at first. Um, trellis system was developed by Fumi Takeda and the USDA. And the whole point of this is to allow the floricanes to be, um, or the primocanes as they develop, they're moved over to this long one. 
Then they're laid down. This whole bar lays down almost to the ground. Here you can see that's how it was when it came out of the winter. It starts flowering along that upper, uh, upper tier, the upper surface. And then it's picked up just like this one. It's picked up and kind of tilted over eventually as the season progresses so that it's shading the fruit as it's developing. So it allows sun to hit it in the early part of the season and then it keeps rotating so that it's shaded and it's easier to pick. Um, got another couple of diagrams here from the website for the trellis systems folks. But this is the growing and harvesting position where the fruit would be right along this kind of downward slope on the long side. And then, so you harvest it, then you flip it over for the winter, you remove the, the floricanes and then the primocanes that had been starting to grow here are shifted. They're kind of shifted over here, it's wintered. Then it's lifted up to this horizontal option during a good part of the season. And then it's fully lifted to harvest off of it um, later in the season. So I'm gonna show, that was a brief explanation. We have a little video of a kind of a modified shift slash uh, rotating cross arm trellis that I took during, I'm gonna stop sharing so that we can show this video. It's a three minute video. I think it'll help you understand it a little bit better. And then Jeremy Wolf from Green Acres and West Wind Fruit Farms are gonna, is gonna talk about his experience with this system. So if we could play that video. We have a floricane wall and we have a primocane training wall and they flip flop. So next year, that primocane stays on that, on that side of the trellis and it becomes a floricane. We tear all this out and we will train on this side of the trellis next year. So it just oscillate back and forth. The challenge was figuring out how do we rotate this system so that we can have two trellises operating independently. So you can see here, what we actually had is this trellis was over here this morning and they lean together like you see the rows are kind of growing together and then when you want to put it into the flowering position we lay it over center we rotate it over center and lay it down so those buds break and grow towards the sun and when we get about 50 percent full bloom then we can rotate it back over into the fruiting position and uh, be ready for harvest so and before we can do that, though, we have to take the blank side of the trellis and lay it down on the ground so it's out of the way. And then that makes room for this floricane side to come on over. The hardest part about this whole process is training the primocane on the training wire. These two wires right here are the training wires. They don't move. They stay stationary. One of the things that we learned, this training wire was too low on our original planting. It was about 12 to 16 inches off the ground. We raised that up to about 18 to 20 inches off the ground. Much easier to work. You're not breaking your back so much. It also gives you a little more time because this primocane grows really fast in May and June. And you don't want that to get up 36, 40 inches tall because if you try to bend that, it just snaps off. So when we get about eight to 12 inches above this wire, we're wanting to bend that real gently and tie it with a max tapener. So you can see we're using this green tape right here to train this primocane down the training wire. Once we reach the next plant, we'll tip prune that, and then that'll encourage these lateral breaks to start coming out on the primocane. And then we're using branch lock to attach that to this trellis wire. They'll kind of spread themselves out as you go down the, the field and roll it over. So it, it goes relatively quickly if you have enough people to do it. I know I've seen like the RCA system, it's much easier to, it kind of just like goes over like a deck of cards. 
being uh, rolled over. That's not the case with our system here. Um, so again, we got to rotate that over center so those blooms come back up uh, on this side, and then we bring it back, and all that fruit's hanging down, so it's easy to harvest. All right, so I want to thank um, a Andy Gallimberti. He's our technician for kind of putting all the footage together for that video. Um, I was able to go down to the North American Raspberry Blackberry uh, conference last year and was on a bus tour where we saw that training system at Eckert's farm in uh, Illinois and just right close to the um, uh, Missouri border. And so their, their situation at Eckert's is a little different than what we're dealing with, which they were able to bring that first training wire up and needed to for the ease of the, you know, just handling all that growth. We need to keep that uh, horizontal, uh, you know, that, that bunch of canes down closer to the ground so that we can actually keep them, we can winterize them. So we're doing a very similar kind of system for different reasons. And that's why he modified his system quite a bit. Um, but it's still basically the same type of thing. And I know there's a few people on the call that have done very similar modifications for their own situation. And I wanted to, Jeremy Wolf, I, while I've never been to his farm, um, I just, uh, Esther Kibbe recommended that he talk because he's had some experience with this. And Jeremy, I'm hoping that you could unmute yourself and start your video and maybe just talk about what you've experienced with this system and also tell us a little bit about your farm. Excellent. Uh, my name is Jeremy Wolf. I've been farming for about 10 years now. I took over after my father-in-law passed away. Um, my wife's fifth generation in the farming community. Um, when we took over, we wanted to introduce some new ideas to the farm, try and do some things differently. Um, so we installed the RCA system. Um, we've been using it for about six years now. We have had great success with it after some uh, trial by fire on the farm. Um, the installation of it was a little frustrating. The instructions that we got were handwritten instructions um, on a piece of paper from the company. Uh, I have looked and they have since uh, greatly improved their instructions for installation. Um, a couple of things that we learned right away when we laid them down for the winter, we tried laying them down a little too early before all the leaves were off and mice created a bunch of nests in there underneath the covers where it was nice and warm and they girdled uh, almost all of the plants for the second year that we had them. Um, so now what we do is we wait a little bit longer, uh, maybe even into the first snowfall um, we put down heavy mouse bait, then we cover them with the covers and the sandbags, and that seemed to uh, alleviate that problem for us. Um, we run a UPIC farm, and the popular, like the community, has really taken to harvesting off of them because it's so easy for them to see the fruit right in front of their faces. So we see that they uh, tend to. Uh, pick a little bit more than what we were doing before with um, just the standard trellis that uh, the plants were kind of growing all over the place and there was real no structure to them. Um, let's see here. Uh, I recommend unless you have a large workforce to have shorter um, rows, even with the RCA system, uh, it tends to be a little difficult to get them uh, standing them up, laying them down. The covers um, tend to blow away if you don't have enough sandbags. So we found that shorter rows were a lot easier to work with than much longer rows, uh, four or 500 foot rows. We prefer uh, the three rows that we have that are right around 100 foot. They are much more easy to manage. We don't have a very large workforce. So for us, that was um, something that I wish we could have done differently. We have two rows that are over 500 feet and we have three rows that are right around 100 foot. So um, that would be some experiences that we've learned over the last few years with them. Jeremy, can, that's wonderful, thank you. Uh, can you share what varieties you're growing on the trellis? We have triple crown. Um, we have 
um, just flat beds. We don't have any raised beds or anything like that. We have pretty good drainage uh, where we planted them. Um, they're going into their seventh year this year and we still see fruit quality and production um, almost better than ever. It seems to improve every year, whether that's us adjusting you know, our timing with rotating the trellis um, and, and whatnot. I am still very happy with the overall outcome with using the systems. And can you um, describe a little bit the timing? I know this probably isn't consistent every single year, but when you decide you're going to rotate down, what are you looking for in the plant to say, okay, it's time to winterize right now? So we typically take the covers off right about the same time, uh, you know, all the snow is gone. And then I just check them periodically. As soon as we start seeing any break, uh, in the tissue, then we put them horizontal with the ground and we wait um, until we see, you know, 50, 60% flowering. And then we start adjusting that upwards um, throughout the season. It's sometimes we have a warm spring, so it goes very quick. Other times we have a much uh, slower rainy season. So it seems like we're waiting forever for them to mature. Okay. And do you bring it over to the harvest um, angle when you've actually got fruit size that's ready to color or is it starting to color when you actually bring it all the way over to the harvest position? Uh, we have a lot of things going on the farm. So typically I try and get them over to the harvest position as soon as we start seeing uh, the fruit sizing uh, much before it's even coloring up just so that it's, it's done. It's one less thing that we have to worry about. Um, right. And that's, that's how we're operating. And then while you're managing this, um, you know, the rotating, the current harvest crop, the primocanes are coming up. What are you doing with those primocanes as they emerge and kind of, are you pulling them over to that short side or are you just letting them grow? Uh, we have done both depending on how busy we get in the springtime. Um, there is a difference. We try to now every year, get them over to the short side, get them trained get them tied. Um, we had them and that seems to work really well for us. Okay. And are you using the same kinds of clips and tape that uh, Chris Eckert described, the max tapener and then the, those little clips that go around the cane? We only use the clips. Um, okay. We used the tape one year and I didn't think uh, it was a little bit more time consuming getting it on there. It didn't always hold well. So those clips, you can reuse them. Uh, it's less waste on the farm and uh, they seem to work a lot better for us. Okay, great. And then in the fall, when you're approaching winter, what are the, what are the, the clues? Like, when do you decide to put that uh, fruiting wall down? We wait until almost all of the leaves are gone because the first year uh, we put them down way too early. Um, all the leaves just were still attached they decayed, the mice made nests out of them. Um, that was a nightmare situation for us that very first year. So we wait, uh, we've done it as late as uh, Thanksgiving, just waiting for the majority of the leaves to, to be gone and, and blow away. We mow the grass very short, uh, even sometimes there's a little snow there. Mow the grass real short, mouse bait, get them down, cover them up as fast as we can. Okay, great. Uh, there is a question about the, the canes, and I know I'm, I have to admit it is baffling to me how they are not, because I do think blackberry canes are fairly brittle. And so it's just interesting that the, they seem to adapt to that, this trellis. And do you, do you think that there's any effect on the root integrity of the plants? Does it cause the canes to split? We haven't found that. When we're trying to train them, uh, they're still very bendable. We we have broken some of them, but um, I think it's something that you have to do in stages. You can't just go out there one day and say, okay, we're gonna get this done today. Um, we work at it one day a week for, for a couple of weeks, trying to train those new um, canes in their position that you're comfortable with. Okay, great. There's a question about the advantage of that secondary trellis arm and wondering why not let the primocanes grow on the same arm. Uh, it makes trimming a little bit easier um, the following year. Uh, I can almost put anyone out there and just tell them to cut 
everything on the one side and it can get achieved versus uh, if you're trying to grow them both on the same side, you're looking for color, the brittleness, you're looking for, you know, buds and everything else. So for me, peace of mind, it's a little more work to train them on the opposite sides, but it's almost foolproof at the end of the day. Yeah. And uh, Curtis, I would say that um, the few people that I know that are kind of doing, they'll have just one rotating wall. There's no second uh, trellis. And that it does just make it a little bit more challenging even for pickers um, because there's so much extra growth. So, and it's not, uh, it's not so obvious to people sometimes uh, when the primocanes are not being trained over to something. And then when you do train them to the same wall, it like, uh, like um, Jeremy says that it's just, it can be it can kind of defeat some of the advantages of what you're trying to do, like open up that canopy and everything. So that second second training system or training wall is really kind of nice. It makes spraying nice too. You can really see, you know, your spray penetrating and getting to the fruit um, versus when you do grow them on the same side, it's very busy. There's a lot of leaves, you know, for every cane you have that's fruiting, you have one next to it that's not. So it's, there's just a lot going on. So um, I've seen that we can spray less and have more effective sprays when they're separated. Great. Um, I don't see any more chat. Maybe people are thinking of questions, but while they're doing that and we have a couple of extra minutes, would you mind just kind of describing your farm operation? Sure. So we are in Greece, New York. We have two farms that are about two miles apart. Um, we run UPIC on both of them. And then three years ago, we opened uh, Blue Barn Cidery, where we also have a store where we sell our own fruit that we grow. And all the extra access fruit from the farms, we turn into hard cider. Um, so we grow peaches, plums, apricots, blueberries, raspberries, um, apples. We're um, always trying to find another way to use the fruit within our own facility. We used to go to packing houses, sell to stores and other things, and we've just brought that all in-house now. Great. And can you just, the, the brewery is a fairly new venture, right? Yes, we opened uh, the cidery about three years ago, um, seen a huge response from the public. We also opened a wedding venue two years ago, which wasn't the greatest idea of a flash year going on. Um, so we have uh, two different facilities right on the farm um, that we entertain the public. They come, they didn't even know there was a UPEC farm here. So we've seen a nice boost with our UPEC operation with new customers coming in. That's great. Um, before we let you go, there is one more question. Uh, when do you move the primocanes to the other side? We move them, we try to move them in the spring. If we have a late fall, um, we have one year trimmed and moved them over uh, in the fall time, but typically it's in the spring. All right, great. Anybody have any last questions before we let Jeremy? I, I hope you don't mind, but he's a brand new father of, <laughs> of a very, very little, just about a week, right? So a uh, week old, yes. Yeah, that's great. Congratulations. Thank you. So we'll let him go, um, but. Uh, Thank you, Jeremy. And I hopefully you'll stick around just for the next 30 minutes so that uh, if there's any other questions, we, we can get them. And I think Courtney's still on. So if anybody has any variety of questions, just stick them in the chat. And if you do chat uh, privately to somebody, um, that's great. But then the rest of the people can't hear, see the questions. So try to chat your question to everyone. All right, thanks a lot, Jeremy. I appreciate it. Uh, we do have to do a quick uh, another little quick poll or two. So please just uh, answer that. Those of you looking for DEC credits, this is a requirement again. And uh, those of you not, just, just answer the poll. We'll give everybody about a minute to answer the question. So we've got about 40 seconds um, for everybody to do DEC credits. And then we will have one more question after this.
All right, you got about five more seconds and then we're gonna end this poll. All right. And uh, most everybody answered yes on that question. And then poll number three. And again, we're gonna leave this up for about a minute. All right, you've got about five seconds left if you want to answer the question. And we are going to end this poll. Those are the results and all right, we are all done. All right, great. Um, thanks, Natasha, for the, your help with that. And uh, our next speaker, actually, that that poll question is kind of interesting because we're slightly, we're almost split on whether or not people think you have viruses or suspect viruses in your planting. And Julie Carroll is going to talk about um, viruses now. And Dr. Julie Carroll led the New York State response to a virus survey that we did a couple of years ago. And Julia, if you wouldn't mind um, sharing your screen, we'd love to hear from you. She's gonna give us the results and kind of an overview of what she's seeing out in the field. Can you see my slides, Laura? Do you see the right one? Yep, it's perfect, thank you. Okay, all right. So today I'm going to talk about the virus survey that we participated in. The people involved were uh, myself, Laura, Jim O'Connell with Ulster County Cooperative Extension, Esther Kibbe with the Harvest New York program uh, in Western New York, and Courtney Weber, who you heard from earlier. And now I have to figure out how to advance. <laughs> Next slide. Okay. Sometimes if you look right on the uh, presentation, there's little arrows down at the lower left-hand corner. Oh, okay. I have my chat box showing the actual present on top of that. All right. Okay. So Bob Martin, a uh, plant virologist with USDA ARS in Oregon and who is now with Oregon State University. He's retired from the USDA ARS. And that's his picture there in the upper corner, um, was doing this virus survey, wanting to focus on what viruses, even virus-like nucleic acid and some other organisms like xylella, fastidiosa, and phytoplasmas were in rubus species nationwide. These organisms, well, they're not really organisms. Viruses aren't organisms. Um, these entities, these infectious agents, are targeted by certification programs. And the results of the survey are going to be used to inform these certification programs about what they should be targeting for. What are the key infectious agents they should be targeting their certification programs for? to create clean stock indexing programs for North America. To date, we have results in uh, for about 16 to 27 of the target pathogens. And unfortunately, the pandemic has delayed our receiving the results because for quite a while, Bob was locked out of his lab and then unfortunately, somebody in his lab did get COVID. So things have been a little dicey the last year trying to get these results. 
The samples were tested using PCR to detect nucleic acid of a putative viral or virus-like agent or one of the other uh, infectious agents, or ELISA, which is an antibody test that would detect the pathogen's protein. And I think a lot of you are probably familiar with these tests because these are exactly the same types of tests that are used currently to find out whether you have COVID or whether you have been infected with COVID. In New York, we collected samples from the areas shown in orange on the map. They were collected from farms and wild areas near raspberry and blackberry fields. And Courtney and I also collected samples from his fruit breeding program at Cornell Agritech and in some of the wild brambles surrounding those. So now before sharing the results, because again, they're looking at everything. This is a shotgun approach to look at every possible uh, virus-like and virus organism infectious agent that's in these samples. I wanted to share with you a little bit of information about the main viruses that we know infect red raspberries, black raspberries, their hybrids, and blackberries in the Northeast. So I'm going to group these viruses by the vector that transmits them from an infected plant to a healthy plant. There are aphid transmitted, nematode transmitted, and pollen transmitted viruses that infect brambles in New York State. Now, I cannot emphasize to you enough that all of these viruses can be transmitted by propagation and grafting. So this is a cautionary tale. What I want you to come away with is that it is crucially important that you purchase clean stock from a reputable nursery and that you don't propagate your own brambles because not only can they be propagated through cuttings, uh, divisions of the crown, things of that nature, but many of these viruses can also be seed transmitted. They can also be in the seed. So the aphid transmitted diseases include raspberry mosaic and raspberry leaf curl. So the exciting thing about viruses is that they can be really confusing and basically their, their names are like alphabet soup. Acronyms have become standard fare, as you know. DNA, COVID, those are all acronyms, basically. Um, so raspberry mosaic disease is a complex of up to five viruses that when they co-infect, they cause a serious disease. These viruses include black raspberry necrosis virus, rubus yellow net virus, raspberry leaf model virus, raspberry leaf spot virus, and a raspberry leaf spot like virus. I didn't have enough time to dive into the literature to see if this raspberry leaf spot like virus has more recently been characterized. But as you can well imagine, characterizing these small nucleic acid entities can be pretty difficult, isolating them from the plant, purifying them, and characterizing them. I say that because, excitingly, I studied plant viruses for my PhD. The other virus transmitted by aphids is raspberry leaf curl. It's a little easier because it's a disease that's caused specifically just by one virus, raspberry leaf curl virus, RLCV. A nematode transmitted virus, which many of you may have heard from or know about, tomato ring spot, causes a disease that's often called crumbly berry. Tomato ring spot virus is transmitted by the dagger nematode. 
There is also a pollen transmitted virus, raspberry bushy dwarf, raspberry bushy dwarf virus. Those are nice, raspberry leaf curl, tomato ring spot, raspberry bushy dwarf, because they're caused by one virus that's the same as the name of the disease. It's not always the case. And raspberry mosaic is the classic example there. So moving along, I'm gonna just go over these different diseases for you so that you'll have a background of information about these viruses before we get to the results of the survey. So again, raspberry mosaic caused by five different viruses, most severe on black raspberry. The black raspberry necrosis virus will initially cause a necrotic tip of the cane that curls over almost like fire blight in apple trees because it's killed as it's growing and you get that shepherd's crook ne necrosis. It also can infect red raspberry and is least severe on blackberry. After the tip necrosis phase, the disease will cause leaf blistering, mottling and dwarfing or depending on the cultivar, it may be symptomless or mild. And as with many viral diseases, after the first shock of infection, the plants kind of get used to it and they, they sort of hang out and they continue to grow. Symptoms may be masked for all viral infections in plants by high temperature or really good nutrition and really good cultural practices to grow the plants. Now there are some virus resistant varieties and these include Festival, Titan, Tulamine, and Royalty. The vector is the large raspberry aphid. And yes, that is the common name of this aphid. You can see it in the lower uh, picture. Now, can you see my cursor on the, then I could maybe use that as a pointer. Yep. Can you see my, okay, great. So this is the large raspberry aphid. And the neat thing about this aphid is it's the typical aphid colony type thing. If you go up to it, they have the startle response and they'll drop from the plant. Well, guess what? If the plant is infected with a virus, that startle response actually helps them move from one plant to the other and spread the disease locally. Aphids have winged forms. And these winged forms, if they're virulifers, are responsible for like within field spread. So they will carry the virus then to plants further afield. These aphids peak in numbers in mid-June to mid-August. The viruses are transmitted semi-persistently. That means they're acquired within minutes from an infected plant and can transmit them within minutes to another plant. And they'll hang on to the, they, they can keep the virus in them for several days, unless they're starved. And then it'll stay there like in laboratory settings for up to 20 days. Interestingly, in raspberry, there are a number of varieties that are aphid resistant. And these include Algonquin, Festival, Titan, Tulamine, and Royalty. So management involves planting clean certified stock, resistant varieties. Managing aphids with insecticides will slow infield spread and plant to plant spread, but it does not prevent infection by viriliferous aphids. The only material that there is data to show that it disrupts aphid virus transmission into the plant is JMS stylet oil or a mineral oil. And um, I don't know if it would be safe to apply mineral oil to, to brambles, whether there might be some issues in terms of leaf burn or something like that. Um, but managing aphids will prevent spread or slow the spread of the disease. The other things involve um, crop management choices that we make, and I think Courtney alluded to that earlier, we can select sites that don't have wild brambles in the surrounding area. 
If the planting is infected and it's weak and not yielding well, we may choose to remove that planting sooner. We can also plant larger plantings. And this goes for, I wish I had a drawing board because I would, I would draw this out for you. So think of a square versus a rectangle. A rectangle has a much higher edge to area ratio. And with aphid transmitted viral diseases that often come into the crop via wind-blown aphids or the winged aphids that fly into the field, they are typically intercepted on the edge of the planting. And the edge plants will show infection sooner. So if you can have a larger planting with the edge around it that will intercept it, being made up of a smaller numerical, you know, a smaller number of plants, then the plants in the interior are less prone to infection and spread of virus. Okay, so moving on. Now we'll talk about raspberry leaf curl. This is also vectored by an aphid, but it's vectored by the small raspberry aphid. This is a sluggish aphid. It doesn't have a startle response. And so the spread of this virus in your bramble patch is going to be much slower as a result. There are two peaks of aphid populations for the small raspberry aphid, one in July and the other in early October. And that early October peak may also depend on weather and when we, when we get frosts and things like that. The disease is most severe on red raspberry and black raspberry. Blackberry may not show symptoms. Symptoms include the curling of leaves, distorted leaves, chlorotic shoots, and you can see that in this picture here. It's really quite a devastating disease when it occurs. But again, spread is slow, which is a good thing because otherwise it would be kind of like SWD, it would be pretty difficult to grow uh, brambles in New York if the spread of this disease was quick and moved through your field quickly. Often the spread is associated with the prevailing winds. As I mentioned, the aphids get blown by the wind. Indeed, um, there are sampling uh, fans that are used in Illinois to sample the upper air currents and to determine when aphids are being blown in so that the grain crop can be uh, protected from the aphids that are being blown in. So these are small insects that can get up into those uh, air currents and get blown in, and they can also get blown in the wind. Uh, so I know that um, I, you know, I've been up along Lake Ontario and there are some sites that the prevailing wind is pretty significant. So management, again, planting clean certified stock, thus our survey, plant away from the wild brambles, especially blackberry. We don't have to worry about that so much in our environment or old plantings where this disease may have built up or there may be a reservoir in one or two infected plants. Again, managing aphids with insecticides will slow plant to plant spread, but it doesn't, it will not pre prevent infection. Um, this virus is persistently transmitted by the small raspberry aphid. That means it stays in the aphid regardless of whether the aphid molts. And so it's there. Once the aphid has it, it's going to carry it. Annual roguing of infected plants brings up an important aspect of scouting for virus diseases and pulling them up. Economic studies have shown that you can rogue up to 10% of plants that are infected with the raspberry leaf curl before it's probably time to remove the planting because your economic return is, is uh, not going to be there any longer. 
Now on to tomato ring spot or crumbly berry. This is probably most serious on red raspberry, but it can also occur on blackberry. It isn't known to occur on black raspberry. And Courtney may have more uh, you know, thoughts on whether this is a problem on hybrids you know, between red raspberry and black raspberry. Crumbly berry is the main symptoms, are the main symptoms, but the plants actually, when they're initially infected, will be slow to leaf out in the spring by one to two weeks. Plants, by virtue of being infected, will be weakened, and they may eventually die out. So the symptoms are striking at initial infection, like I said, but then they kind of grow out of it, but they limp along. The disease spreads within a planting in ever widening oval patterns to circular patterns, expanding about two meters per year. And the seed of the plants may be infected and carry tomato ring spot as well. The vector is the dagger nematode. And this is a picture of the stylet of the nematode. You can see it's like a dagger. This is a new replacement that's actually developing in the nematode because these are animals and they molt in order to grow kind of like a snake. And these are fairly large nematodes when they're full grown, they're about two millimeters in size and it takes them about a year to uh, be become fully grown. They move fairly slowly in the soil and, and thus that's why you get this slow ever widening pattern of infected plants. The dagger nematode can transmit tomato ring spot virus for several months once it's been acquired from an infected plant. And tomato ring spot has a very wide host range. It infects even the weeds such as dandelion in your planting. Management involves, again, clean certified stock. Before putting a planting in, test the soil for dagger nematodes. And if they're present, consider chemical fumigation or using biofumigant cover cropping to reduce the dagger nematode population. They are more common on sandier soils. They prefer that but those are gonna be the soils that are most beneficial for growing raspberries. Rogue infected plants and, wait a minute, five symptomless plants in each direction. Did I forget that to take that out from the other slide? Nope. So this is important, it's moving. And what they have found in Oregon is that if you remove five symptomless plants on either side of the infected plant, you're gonna be sure to take out any risk of infection and the nematode. Controlling broadleaf weeds in the row middle, using sod row middles, ryegrass and fescue will also be very important for managing this disease. Raspberry bushy dwarf is the last virus that I'm going to cover in detail. This is the one that's pollen spread, and this is why I had the picture of the pollinator on the first slide. This disease occurs on red raspberry, black raspberry, hybrids, blackberry, and wild rubus. It has, you know, it is a rubus specialist. It causes druplet abortion and crumbly berry. And other than that, the symptoms aren't that severe. So the name that it has is actually not that accurate, but it will dwarf and cause severe symptoms on plants when it is co-infected with other viruses. And that's where it got its common name, dwarfing, shoot proliferation, ring and line patterns of yellow and light green will occur on distorted leaves. It is spread by pollen. It is found in seed of blackberry. It, sorry, black raspberry, if black raspberry is infected. 
Seed in red raspberry will be infected, but only typically if both parents are infected. In other words, the pollen has to carry the virus and the, the maternal ovary also has to have the virus. Management involves planting clean certified stock and choosing resistant varieties. And there are a number of these. So in red raspberry, we would be looking at Boyne, Killarney, Coachan, I probably killed the name of that variety, Bristol, Latham, Octavia, Heritage, Dorman Red, Willamette, Moutier, and Kiwi Gold. In Blackberry, Chester and Triple Crown are considered resistant. So now on to the results. What has the survey found so far? And I wanted to put this map up again. Western New York are these counties, Central New York are these counties, and the Eastern New York data is from these counties. So from Eastern New York, 76 plant samples were tested so far for 16 pathogens. Only four tenths of a percent were, were found to be positive. So that was five positive results out of 1,216 plant sample virus combinations that were tested. In central New York, there were two batches of samples that were submitted. In one, seven tenths of a percent were positive. In another, 1.6% were positive. And in Western New York, out of 28 plant samples that were submitted for testing, so far they've tested for 25 pathogens, 1.4% were positive. So, gosh, you know, that's a lot of pathogens that they're testing for, right? And I still haven't gotten from Bob the, the full list of the pathogens that they're going to be testing for. But highlighting this, there were 11 out of 275 total plant samples that were sent in that had raspberry bushy dwarf. That's a pollen-borne virus. I wasn't really excited about hearing or you know, getting those results. Pollen gets around and pollinators pick it up and they spread it around and they can fly a half a mile easily. Um, so that may explain why there are 4% of samples that tested positive for raspberry bushy dwarf virus. But excitingly, that's not 43%, which is the number of those of you who are here who thought you have viruses in your planting. 10 of the samples tested positive for raspberry leaf model. That's the one that spread by the large raspberry aphid vector and implicated in the raspberry mosaic disease. Four had tomato ring spot virus or crumbly berry, which is the one that spread by the dagger nematode. Interestingly enough, black raspberry necrosis virus, although they were testing for three different strains of this virus was not detected in any of the samples. So stay tuned as we get more results in. And the other thing that I wanted to point out is that we collected our samples in July and August. Better results are obtained when you're surveying for viruses if you're collecting tissue in the spring. So that could contribute to a lower titer of the infectious agent in the plant and reduce detection. The other thing is we had to ship our samples to Oregon. So I'm sure they know how to deal with the samples on their end, but hopefully all of them went through okay. And we didn't get any emails back from Bob saying, hey, can you collect again because your samples got destroyed because they sat in the post office for five weeks or something. We didn't ship them over Christmas, thankfully. So what do these findings mean to you? I mean, to me, they mean that most growers are probably purchasing clean plant material. And I'm really happy about that. 
The other thing is that most bramble plantings are probably not kept in production for too long before they're being removed and replanted in another location. Are viruses potentially a bigger problem than we thought? You know, the aphid and nematode vectored viruses weren't prevalent on the farms that were sampled, but that's not to say that if we were sampling in the spring and we were testing locally, when the leaves were fresher, we might not have found more viruses or more samples infected with viruses is the better way to say that. The pollen-borne raspberry bushy dwarf virus might become an issue. Is that possible? I don't know. That's the only one I was kind of worried about given the results I've seen so far. So what can you guys do and gals, what can you all do to reduce the risk? you can plant only certified stock that is indexed for viruses. And as Mark Fuchs has often told the apple growers when he's given talks, ask the nursery, ask the certifier, which viruses are you testing the raspberry stock for? That will give you a sense of whether the certified stock is really certified for the viruses that you are most concerned about and that we covered today in our talk. So I wanna thank those who participated in this study, the growers who allowed us to sample on their farms. We really appreciate that. And thanks go out to my collaborators, Laura, Jim, Esther, and Courtney. If any of you wanna contact me about plant viruses, they're my favorite plant pathogen. I would love to hear from you and my contact information is there. And then if you guys have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them. And I hope I didn't go over time because I wasn't watching the time and I think I did. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, it's, it's not bad. You only a couple minutes, so we're good. We're all good. Um, I, I am kind of hopeful that we can get a couple questions. It seems like people might have questions about um, viruses. I have a couple questions. Um, so my first question, Julie, is that, you know, you implied that our results may have been somewhat um, affected by the time of year that we gathered the samples. And so I just, I am constantly uh, just baffled by viruses. I think that I know that there's a virus there and I send the samples and uh, you know, oftentimes it'll come back negative and yet I just, it, it's like classic simple symptoms. So it's very frustrating. Um, and then sometimes I won't even think something looks at all vi virusy and that we send it in just because the grower wants to make sure. And all of a sudden it's, you know, it's a positive result. And so I don't like, is there a, like how many times, like what's the percentage of accuracy <laughs> when you send it in? Is there is there something, I mean, we've all figured this out because of COVID and the false positives, false negatives. Oh, right. <clears throat> frustrating. That's a, yeah, so that's a really good question. And it's a really good analogy that you're drawing with COVID. I think it's important to keep in mind, COVID is one virus with one, you know, maybe several strains, right? And here we're dealing with a shotgun approach of numerous viruses. So one of the things that stood out for me, for instance, was that um, raspberry leaf spot virus and raspberry leaf curl virus were not tested for in any of these samples. And I went back and I looked and one of those viruses, I can't remember off the top of my head, is very difficult to purify from the plant. Therefore, you can't make antisera for it for an ELISA test, or even know the sequence so that you could create primers, DNA primers or for it, so that you could amplify it for a PCR test. And so to answer your question about the percent accuracy or the percent detection, uh, like false negatives, false positives, it would be virus specific. I would have to give you that percentage for every single one of the viruses that's being Got tested. It. Got it. So, you know, and I can't, 
I can't do that, number one, because Bob Martin hasn't shared that information with me. Um, and number two, I didn't look that information up specifically. Um, having done some sampling in apple orchards for viruses over the past uh, three or four years, I can say that certain viruses can be detected regardless of when you sample for them. That, that whether it's spring or fall, it doesn't really matter. Apple stem pitting virus is, is one. Um, and the samples that we collected in May this year and the results from those from apple orchards were not all that different from the samples that we had collected in the summer, the leaf samples. Um, the other thing that can, can weigh in with testing is that viruses are not distributed uniformly, typically, especially in perennial plant crops. So like a raspberry has canes that grow up. Some of the canes might be infected, some may not. So those are those those are yeah. some thoughts uh, for you on on that. And then of course there are so many other things that can lead to similar symptoms on plants: herbicide injury, uh, nutritional uh, problems, you know, micronutrient deficiencies, micronutrient excess, um, sometimes even winter damage. Uh, of leaves can cause them to curl because certain tissues have been killed by a cold snap. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you, Julie. That's really good points. And also for those of you that were here yesterday when Marvin Pritz was giving his diagnostic talk, um, the, all of these things, trying to look at patterns, observation over time, all of those things will help us try to figure out what's going on when some of the diagnostic tests are not necessarily immediately accessible or they just aren't as helpful. Frustratingly, they aren't as helpful, even though if we kept sending the samples and maybe we would get, you know, information. But anyway, I do, I, I've got a couple people uh, texting um, that they have to leave and that's fine. You guys have all, uh, you, you've achieved the DC, uh, protocol. So that's great. And Julie, thank you so much. I do have one more question that I hope we can answer, but I want to let people go if they have to go. And uh, thank you, Courtney and Jeremy has already left. Um, thank you so much, Natasha and Chelsea for helping with the technical aspects of this and Andy for assisting with the video. All of this stuff is going to be on the Teachable. I did put um, the the website for registration to the North American Raspberry Blackberry Association virtual conference that's ongoing right now. You can still sign up. And there's, if you're really interested in caneberry um, production, that's the place to go for that information. So don't hesitate. I think this is a, a unique opportunity to get kind of world-class information at some of these larger conferences that you'd have to travel for. So do check it out. Um, and yeah, Julie, this was a really great presentation. I hope to see it uh, in even different venues. So that's good. Um, I do have one quick question about roguing out uh, neighboring plants. And so I'm interested in what you think about that as a uh, kind of advice to growers that might have uh, a mosaic virus in their, or, or nematode, um, vectored viruses in their blueberries or, or whatever other plants. Would roguing out those neighbor plants be a really good strategy for slowing that whole thing down? Um, I think that it is a classic strategy. So in plant virology and managing viruses in general, roguing infected plants is a classic step that is taken to slow the spread of the disease. Ziphanema does not move quickly through the soil. Um, it is a relatively fragile nematode. So, you know, digging up the entire root system and carefully, probably you would need to bag it and get it out uh, is important. I think that if you think about 
the analogy with, with raspberry, if it's five raspberry crowns in a planting system in Oregon, and Courtney can, can uh, correct me, um, I would say that that might be about a meter, you know, five, maybe, maybe a little less than a meter or a little more than a meter. So if you're doing five raspberry plants on each side, basically what you're doing is you're trying to get rid of that two meters per year spread um, because it'll take a while for the plants that have just been inoculated by the nematode to express symptoms. The tighter the virus has to build up, the new primocanes growing out of the root system where the virus titer has built up from the infection have to be infected and, and therefore show symptoms. So if we take that as analogous in the blueberry setting, you may only need to take one plant on each side, depending on the, you know, the spacing within the row of the blueberry planting, um, possibly two. So the infected plant and then two on each side. I think that it would slow the spread. Um, I think it would be beneficial uh, to do. I think that it would take an economist to do a study to find out whether, you know, when the breakpoint on the economics happens. Because you've got labor and you know removal of plants that potentially may be yielding for a while, um, that type of thing to consider. Yeah, great. Well, thank you. I, it is just uh, viruses are just really tough to figure out what to do with the best strategy. So that was really helpful. So, Laura, to comment on that, as Julie pointed out, the, the blueberries and the black raspberry they don't spread. The plant doesn't spread. So it would probably be more effective in those crops than, it, than in red raspberry because the root system is spreading so much. So in red raspberry, I think you would have to go back to the site again in the future to check for root pieces that had re-sprouted um, because it's not much of a root piece for a new plant to come up and uh, it might be infected too and, and, and you didn't get all of the plant. It's a lot harder with, with black raspberry and and uh, blueberry, you know, it's more of a distinct plant and they wouldn't come back from a root piece. Um, I mean, we see it, it's useful in raspberry, black raspberry and orange rust and in blackberry. They're not viruses, but a similar thing where it's internal and you have to get rid of the plant, otherwise it'll spread. And so that's the recommendation for that kind of disease as well, to remove the whole plant and to try to stop the spread. So yeah. Sort of, yeah. potential. Okay. But, I like said, how many plants before your crop, your, your field's got too many holes in it before? <laughs> uh, that's an economic decision. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, I, we've still got about 20 something people on the, the Zoom. Does anybody have any additional questions before we have to let Courtney and Julie go? Uh, those of you who if you were like me, I got kicked off midway. Hudson Valley Wireless, I think, had a big surge or something. And so those of us that were on that network got kicked off and then on. But the recording was going the whole time. So the recording will be there. And um, yeah, it just um, this was really nice to see you, your faces, you guys. And thank you for joining today.